The deserts really are one of the last frontiers of wilderness, but it also deserves more attention in terms of understanding how we can rapidly develop renewable energy in a way that limits environmental impacts. Well, I think uh, there's a common misconception that like, the desert is a barren and lifeless place, and that's really as far from the truth as you can get, in my opinion. Once you start you know, walking around in the desert, you start to see tons of life, and that was something that was surprising to me. The Mojave Desert is uh, very much a land of extremes. For several weeks in the spring and for several weeks in the fall, this area comes alive. It, it feels vibrant. The, the, there's electricity in the air. The thunderstorms roll through. The desert comes alive. The plants turn green. The tortoises are out. Rabbits and hares are everywhere. Unquestionably, solar energy is going to be one of the most important parts and solutions to this broader problem of climate change. The issue is how can we find ways to benefit the species and communities that are going to be affected so that there will be areas for these functioning habitats, ecosystems, and species to continue to persist. There are definitely other options for siting our renewable energy infrastructure in a way that is highly compatible with the needs that we have for electricity and fuels, but also in a way that can protect the biodiversity that we, that we care about, including the charismatic species like the badgers and the kit foxes and desert tortoises. As far back as the 1970s, anyone who came down here and visited the desert probably saw tortoises wandering all over. They're now at about a tenth of the level that they were at, and that's been due to many factors. Things like habitat loss, the impact of roads, a disease that was really prominent in wild tortoises in the 1970s and 1980s. So part of the work that we do is trying to find ways to help recover these populations that have declined so that tortoises can uh, continue to be a part of the landscape so that people can continue to see them in the desert when they come and visit these places. One of the biggest challenges that desert tortoises face is that it can take them 10 to 20 years naturally in order to become adults themselves and then begin producing offspring of their own. So part of our work is trying to find ways to shorten that period from when an animal hatches till it reaches adulthood. By protecting them from predators early in their life, by giving them extra opportunity to drink with rainfall from sprinklers, by giving them a little bit of extra food in a diet that's very similar to what they would get nutritionally in the wild, they're able to grow much more quickly, sometimes two to four times faster under our care than they would in the wild. So this animal is about six and a half years old, and he's about the size of an animal that's 10 or 12 years old in the wild. Not only is this guy larger, he's also been able to survive about half of these animals aren't able to survive in any given year simply due to natural things. When you start thinking about everything that we humans are doing, um, cars that kill them on roads, the loss of habitat to development, that means that even fewer of these hatchlings are able to reach this size, like all of the ones we have here that have been protected the first six years of their life. We're really not doing anything that different than what these animals would get had they hatched in a really good year without a lot of exposure to things like really hot temperatures, really dry periods, or a lot of predators. So we're kind of giving them the best years of their life very early in life so that they get a head start on this hopefully very long journey of 50 to 100 years of living in the desert and being a part of this bigger community. Humans have an impact on the landscape and on the animals that live in it, and I think that's just a reality of life, and we're just trying to find ways to help compensate for some of the ways we have negatively impacted populations. And one of the potential ways we may be able to do that is by doing head starting. Once you start losing individual species, that's a sign that there's something in the system that's broken, and so healthy environments are also important to us to be healthy as humans. Today, we can still find times and places to see desert tortoises in the wild, but it's getting harder and harder to know that that's gonna be a possibility for future generations. And I think that's something that really motivates me on this project, is the thought that one day my son too will be able to see the same tortoises or new tortoises in this area, like his father did and like those before him did.
you know, getting an understanding for how a whole suite of renewable energy technologies might affect uh, soils, plants, and wildlife, we think is very important moving forward because renewable energy development, energy development, is gonna continue to occur. There's more and more people in the world that require more and more energy. So we think it's a really relevant field that deserves a lot of attention. We have a bunch of mirrors beaming light to that tower, generating energy. And they're also casting shade on the ground. And when water hits the mirrors and it runs off onto the ground, that's altering the way water, which is very limited in the desert, is being dispersed over the surface. So what we're interested in is understanding the interaction between the mirrors from the solar facility uh, altering microhabitat on soil. Then the soil can affect a particular plant, that's the Mojave milkweed, the host plant for uh, several butterfly species in the genus Tineus, and they're laying eggs on this plant. The eggs are turning into caterpillars and they're eating the plant. <laughs> Who cares about a butterfly? Well, here's the deal. The interplay between the soil, plants, and animals in this ecosystem will actually shed light on a lot of what is happening uh, with the broader wildlife communities. We are seeing patterns where there is an effect of the solar facility. In some cases, it can be positive. In other cases, it can be negative. And I think that's a theme that kind of resonates throughout renewable energy ecology, whether you're dealing with wind or forest fire energy, solar energy, there's going to be winners and losers in terms of species. You know, so I think when considering where you're going to site a solar energy facility or any other renewable energy facility, you know, I think undisturbed habitat might be a place that could be considered. But in general, you know, there's, there's plenty of other places for such development to occur. Moving forward, those are the areas that should be explored for renewable energy development before even going into undisturbed natural areas. One of the ways that we can protect desert ecosystems is by putting our renewable energy infrastructure in places that have already been uh, converted or developed. This site, yeah. I basically, um, this is Yes. We see an immense opportunity to actually protect our natural uh, resources by, by utilizing that space within the built environment. And what has really captured our attention are these large commercial buildings. One of the first things that we did was compile a incredibly um, exhaustive list of all of the largest buildings in the U.S. These buildings can be anywhere from 30 to over 140 football fields, big in terms of their rooftop space. Right now I'm trying to figure out where to place the solar panels. So right up here, um, we get a real-time estimate of the installed capacity, um, about 7 megawatts on this particular building, one of 19 that are associated with the Boeing Everett factory. Um, and that's a, lot of, that's a lot of power. The work that we're doing here at UC Davis is understanding how we can utilize these massive surfaces to serve as sites for power plants that provide electricity for humans to use. The number one building in our study, the, the largest building, is Lockheed Martin. And if we were to develop solar energy on this particular building, our results show that we could uh, support 55 megawatts of solar energy. If we were to develop that much capacity on the ground, this would be equivalent to about 400 acres, or in other words, about 300 football fields worth of land spared for either conservation or agriculture, respectively. You know, we have so many commercial buildings in the U.S. There's many that um, are large enough to get PV systems on the rooftops. I think it's important for us to start thinking on top of the box and not outside the box. Let's keep it on top of the commercial site.
The idea of, of using these rooftop surfaces for siding our power plants is just, it's, it's logical, it makes sense, especially when we think about meeting our goals for climate change mitigation, but also protecting important ecosystems like deserts.